I am uh, Shiv Sahai, uh, the <coughs> Joint Secretary in the National Security Council. I will be moderating this panel. Um, may I first uh, introduce the panel? Immediately to the, my right is uh, Mr. Evo Wienkamp. He is uh, an executive director in the Hidayah Center. Mr. Wienkamp has worked extensively with the Dutch government before he joined the Hinjaya Center. He has done a lot of work uh, on countering violent extremism. The Hidayah Center, as you know, uh, is a body that uh, looks at countering extremism both online and offline. And he would be probably speaking on a more comprehensive view on countering violent extremism. Next to him is uh, Eptusham Al Ketbi. She is uh, working with the government of UAE and is a policy making of the air. She's just uh, given us her book titled Killing in the Name of Allah. Next to that is uh, Dr. Klimberg, whose recent book, Darkening Web, is making the rounds. And he is somebody who holds a very strong view about uh, cyber security, and then it should be balanced out with uh, room for genuine protest. And last of all is Mr. Brian Fishman, who is the counter-terrorism <coughs> policy maker for Facebook. So um, he would bring uh, to us the entire issue about how social media is being used as uh, the medium for spreading violent extremism and how it should be balanced out with the concerns that uh, social media platforms have. But taking out from that, uh, the issue is, remains is that are social media platforms platforms or are they media utilities also? And from there, how does their responsibility stem? And what kind of regulations would be required to control social media? I'm sure the counterpoint would come from Mr. Klimberg. And uh, Ivo Wienkamp and uh, <coughs> Ms. Kethby would probably be more concerned about the kind of impact it's creating and in promoting violent extremism. We do have an interesting uh, case where child pornography was universally brought down and it has had a big impact where all social media platforms could get together to bring it down. But there, the, probably the, the uh, paradigms, the, the references were easier to fix. But in case of violent extremism, it is probably more difficult because uh, Everybody is not uh, universal in their approach to the kind of narrative that is put down there. And uh, the old saying that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. So uh, looking at all those aspects, I would uh, request um, the, we can start with the, uh, if you don't mind, Madam, should we start with you? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to add that, uh, I am professor of political science and I am head of think tank called Emirates Policy Center, which uh, helped Ministry of Foreign Affairs in UAE. Uh, well, I think the challenge beside fighting the terrorism is how to win the stomach and minds in this session, since you are <laughs> Well, let me say first that uh, terrorism has no race, has no color, has no religion, has no sect. So it can exist anywhere. It's not related to any area in this world or to any uh, religion. Uh, we had a study. This is 
uh, a product of my center based on a workshop tackling both Sunni and Shia militia, uh, trying to uh, study them and see where is the scenarios is going uh, for both of them. Uh, first, of course, I will take one minute uh, to uh, express my uh, gratitude for this valuable opportunity and important uh, initiative. And I think we are in the right place if we are talking about terrorism uh, and the venue uh, fighting extremism and terrorism, India, of course, because uh, it is the land of Gandhi. And it happened that I was in uh, a conference in Manama last December, and India mentioned that it's the least countries in terms of uh, terrorist group are coming uh, from this country. In addition, the culture, I think, of peace and rejection of violence is deeply rooted in this great uh, nation. Therefore, the value of diversity, pluralism, democracy, tolerance, and the state of uh, citizenship in India are relevant here, unlike India's neighborhood uh, uh, countries which are suffering from social uh, divisions, weak national uh, integration and identity crisis, uh, all of which feed into uh, an inclination uh, towards extremism and uh, radicalism among several segments of society most of the time. And I don't have to mention which countries I think you uh, all know. So I will focus into, uh, 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 in my take, by drawing the roadmap for combating extremism and terrorism to reduce risk associated with uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups and weaken their recruiting capabilities. Uh, it is recommended to adapt. It's not only uh, one kind of policy or measurement. First, what we call it proactive, which is it includes uh, strengthen communication between public and security agencies to report any suspected activities or personnel. Uh, a hotline can be established for this purpose. And here I mention my country. We have a hotline. We call it uh, Al Amin, which is uh, anybody can call if they realize something. Uh, not normal, uh, which is, I think it's very effective. Also to set uh, a guidelines of uh, list of indications that educate people uh, on the various behaviors of people inclined towards terrorist uh, beliefs. Also to integrate uh, courses or, or materials uh, in educational curricula uh, on how to correctly deal with the internet connect, content, and particularly with that inciting uh, terrorist acts, and to design also rehabilitation and reintegration programs for individuals who were involved in terrorist activities uh, through launching a local initiative and partnership between stakeholders and public and private sector, and I think Saudi they did something, but the problem with Saudi that they didn't continue uh, monitoring and following uh, those people. So some of them end to join uh, ISIS. So you have to follow up with these people. Uh, also, uh, to train the employees in the terrorist uh, detention centers and schools on how to deal with intimate or a student with terrorist uh, inclinations. If you, if you pick some of those. 
And second type of this recommendation, I'll call it institutional, which is uh, include to enhance coordination between agencies involved in combating terrorism, their uh, jurisdictions and authorities must be expanded and a policy documents on combating terrorism must be drafted. Sometimes you have, uh, th there is, I will call it, uh, not central mind. Uh, uh, each of one of them uh, working in different uh, sites. So also establishing a mechanism for exchanging information on suspected terrorists between mobile communication companies and internet service providers on one side and state uh, information gathering agency, what we call it security services on the other. The third thing, to improve professional relationship between police forces, uh, the intelligence apparatus, and the judiciary authority in this uh, domain. The last thing, which is uh, media front. Here I want to mention maybe, and I always find it when I uh, download any program in uh, my mobile, that a small icon comes for uh, a small game, which is they call war game. And this is very dangerous. So if any young, you will find them, those young generations, small children, always what they are learning, the war games. And I think this is, should be responsibility of those companies producing these kind uh, of games. It's not only the social media, also, these uh, companies. So uh, usually terrorist groups are uh, use uh, dual approach in building their propaganda. Intimidated and impressed people at the same time. <laughs> a regional and global mass media unfortunately made a mistake by reporting some news of terrorist groups. Some media outlets have covered terrorist activities in a manner that served the interest of these terrorist group, while these uh, attributes uh, uh, intimidate some of uh, segment in public. They impressed others by, by uh, 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 giving these acts an era of terrorism and professionalism. And when, when, you, when you have this ISIS video on YouTube or released on what is the children are watching, what they can learn from it, why do we have uh, to have it? The second thing and, and, and the last, terrorist group have succeeded on social media website where young people find a good platform to express their grievance resentments, and desire for adventure. This, some of them may become vulnerable to recruitment by terrorist uh, a group. Most importantly, the other risk associated with online activity groups is their endeavor to establish what can be described an extremist public opinion in the cyber space. I would just end with this small and short story uh, example for a girl, and this is, uh, in fact, uh, in, uh, she is Christian Belgium, and this is a true story I heard by my friend in Belgium, in our uh, Belgium embassy. She just disappeared for uh, six months, her friend, she didn't hear from her. And after six months, she got a SMS. She told her, well, I am with ISIS. Yes, I lost half of my freedom, but I have an income and I have a job. And you know, I have, uh, I'm holding two master's degree. I've been searching for a work two years. I converted to Islam to join ISIS. So just Please leave this in your minds so when we are talking about 
the root causes of uh, terrorism. Thank you so much. Would you like to come in here, uh, uh, Mr. Brian Fishman? Uh, could you explain uh, the issues about <clears throat> the on the social media and the kind of uh, challenges that you face? Uh, we would like to, to leave some time for the question and answer session. Please. Yeah, I, I'll, I will run through this quickly. Um, it, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's my second time at Rizina, and I, I really uh, appreciated it last year and, and again this time. Um, very quickly, I'm going to run through Facebook's approach to uh, combating terrorism uh, online and on our platform specifically. I'm going to make four big points. Our, our strategy really has four elements. One is, is preventing terrorists from utilizing Facebook specifically. The second is working with our industry partners to improve uh, the ability of industry writ large to, um, to counter terrorism. The, the third is engagement with law enforcement um, and governments around the world. And then the fourth is working with counter speech. How do we promote uh, voices that are looking to push back on terrorism? So the first principle here that I think is really important and, and that was, has already been alluded to um, is that terrorism is a little bit different than child pornography. Um, it is political con content. In many places, it is not explicitly illegal. There are times when even on Facebook, so Facebook, there is no place for terrorism on Facebook. We do not allow the praise, support, or representation of, of terrorism on Facebook. If you are a terrorist, you may not use Facebook. You may not use it to support terrorism. You may not use it to post pictures of puppies or kittens. We do not want you to use Facebook if you are a terrorist. Um, that said, there are times when people post content from terrorist organizations in order to raise awareness about those organizations or to condemn those organizations. And we do allow that, um, which means that in many cases there are human judgment calls about specific pieces of content. And that both is uh, designed to allow for complex political speech, um, but it raises challenges for, for enforcement. Um, we address this in a variety of ways. We currently at Facebook have 180 people across the world whose primary job is countering terrorism. That includes people in our operations teams, it includes folks on our policy teams, and in our legal teams, it is a big operation. The number of people working on enforcing our terms of service is many times that amount, and a lot of those folks touch on terrorism as well, but 180 people whose primary responsibility is dealing with terrorism. But we're increasingly trying to be proactive and find this content before it is reported to us, before, and in many cases, we can take it down um, even without having a human being look at, look at it. Um, and so, for example, um, today, 99% of the ISIS and Al-Qaeda material that we remove from Facebook, we find ourselves uh, through automated systems. 83% um, of that content comes down within its first hour of being on Facebook. And that's because we're automatically detecting that material and pulling it off. Um, now that doesn't mean that, that we're perfect, we find mistakes, um, and, uh, and we're constantly working to get better. Um, but we have made real progress in that regard um, in the last year and, and even before that. Um, as we make that progress, other platforms, social media platforms, are, are making similar strides. Um, and we all recognize, though, that there is going likely to be a displacement effect from the major platforms that have more resources to, to put into this to some smaller platforms online. And that's the, a key element that's driving the development of what's called the Global Internet Forum to Counterterrorism, or GIF-CT which we announced over the summer in conjunction with YouTube, or with Google, YouTube, Microsoft, and Twitter. Um, and GIFCT has three major pillars. The first is information sharing. So we've now run training programs globally for smaller companies to give them basic instruction 
on some of this is really simple. Some, of, but but if you're a small startup tech company, you don't think about the fact that you need to put into your terms of service that terrorism is not allowed. You don't necessarily think about the fact that you need to create a mechanism where people can alert you if a terrorist is using your platform. Many of the new technologists, that's just not why they created their new platform. Um, and we help give them some guidance on, on those processes. We also give them some guidance on what happens when a government comes to you and says, look, we need your help with something. We have teams of lawyers to manage those kinds of situations. Startups don't, and they get scared, and they don't realize that there are very legitimate reasons why governments make those asks sometimes. They don't know how to say yes when it's appropriate. They don't know how to say no when it's appropriate. We give them some guidance on those things. So that's pillar one of GIFCT. The second pillar of GIFCT is something we call a hash sharing database. So what that means, a hash a, a, of a file is like a digital fingerprint of a particular file. Um, and we now have a, a hash database of more than 50,000 hashes of terrorist content that um, is being shared in near real time um, for members of the consortium to utilize to find that content on their own sites. There are now 12 members of this consortium up from the original four. We're growing all the time. We're looking for new members all of the time. Um, and the hash sharing consortium is a real thing. We've got more than 50,000 hashes in it today. It's one of the largest collections of terrorist propaganda probably anywhere. Um, and, uh, and this is showing real effects for some of our smaller partners. More and more companies are coming on, and this will have an impact over time. The last piece of GIFCT is we are collectively funding research into the impact of, of terrorism online. I think it's one of these things that we, is sort of a given now that we assume that the, the impact of the internet on terrorist organizations, but we still haven't really defined that very well. How much of this is, of radicalization is driven by the internet versus offline factors? We want to collectively understand that process better. Um, moving very quickly, um, sometimes people ask us, well, what do you do when you get requests from information from law enforcement? We respond to those requests all of the time um, as appropriate. We also, if in the course of our enforcement procedures come across something that looks like an imminent threat of harm, some real world danger, we will provide that information to the relevant authorities so that they can take action. Um, we think that's important. We think that it, that is part of what we do to keep our community safe, our users safe. Um, lastly, I want to talk quickly about counter speech. Um, Facebook was founded to allow people to connect, to, to communicate, to create community. Um, and so we want to facilitate people creating community in ways that pushes back on extremism. Um, and we do that in, through a number of programs. Um, let me just give one example of a global program and then I'll, and then I'll talk a little bit about how that's applied here in India. Um, but we support something called the peer-to-peer, the, -peer, the Facebook Global Digital Challenge, which is uh, implemented as a curriculum in universities around the globe. Um, and it is a competition. Uh, university students put together campaigns pushing back on extremism in their communities. They decide what they want to push back on. Our curriculum is designed to give them the tools to, um, to build an effective online campaign around their idea. And then there is a competition. And actually, we, we will have the, the finalists in Washington, DC here at the end of the month uh, for the 2017 competition. Those programs have been viewed in the last two years, have received more than 200 million impressions around the world online, not all on Facebook, on a variety of different platforms. So the breadth here is gigantic. Now, I think there are legitimate questions about any countering violent extremism program about the, the real impact. Did it stop people from becoming terrorists? That's a very hard question to answer. We feel comfortable, however, in supporting these programs um, because they're doing good. They're teaching university students how to build online campaigns. Regardless, they're building good ideas in their communities. And some of them are going to have a real impact, some of them less so. And we're comfortable with that, with that reality. 
In India, these are implemented in, in, in a couple of different ways. The, the Indian version of the peer-to-peer -peer program is, is called Voice Positive. It's now running uh, at 56 schools here in India. There are 40 active campaigns under development in 17 states. We're really excited about this, and the, and the local team here is driving this forward. And we think um, it, it, it's really exciting to watch that program take off. We're also running something called the, the Digital Masala Challenge, which is built around a series of hackathons where groups of young people are coming together. The best ideas, we are funding them with $5,000 grants, and nine of those, with those $5,000 in seed money, are now moving forward into a six-month implementation phase going forward here in India. And the reason why I, I emphasize, I mean, obviously we're in India, so that's a good example, but I think what this does is it illustrates how we're trying to take these global principles and apply them in a local setting, which is the only way that we're going to develop um, meaningful campaigns that actually impact local communities. Some of these are going to manifest online, but they have to resonate locally with the issues that people care about. We don't tell people what to say, but we try to create a framework where they can, you know, where they can make those arguments effectively, where they can get their message out to the right audience, and that's how we hope to help. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about this as we go forward, but, but that's the basic overview. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you, Brian. Um, whether all that you said is actually uh, going to have any impact is something that I'm sure uh, Ivo will be able to tell us because he <laughs> deals with the other side of the problem and that is uh, de-radicalization and the impact of the kind of radicalization that is taking place on online. So could you bring the debate and the discussion into the other dimension, please? Thank you, Mr. Sahai. Um, so I will be speaking uh, on behalf of Hedaya, which is the International Center of Excellence for Countering Violent Extremism, uh, an independent uh, international think and do tank based in Abu Dhabi, uh, and as an organization, an initiative of what is called the Global Counterterrorism Forum. Uh, and first of all, of course, I, saw, I also would like to thank the RRF for inviting Hedaya to be able to speak at the Vrijzina Dialogue. What I will do is two things. Uh, as the International Center of Excellence, I want to share with you some uh, global good practices and lessons learned when it comes to communication to uh, work against uh, violent extremist organizations. That's number one. And number two, some uh, concrete examples of tools uh, that we as an organization to develop to actually support strategic communications to prevent radicalization. When it comes to social media, the use of internet, uh, and therefore communications, one major lesson learned, of course, is that nothing beats reality. So uh, what is happening right now is not something in terms of the support for violent extremists and terrorist organizations that we can communicate our way out. Um, communication is important. I think it's even critical. But we should not forget to also look at what is it that make individuals vulnerable in the first place to the messages that were sent to them through social media and that are available on the internet. What are, uh, as we call it, the reasons, the push and pull factors that drive individuals towards violent extremism. And it also means that you need to also work on reducing the push and pull factors as they exist uh, in your own countries. And the push and pull factors can relate to political situations, can relate to economical situations, can relate to religion, can relate to ideology, many things, and they differ in most cases per country. This also means, and that's the second lesson learned, that yes, communication is key, but it will not be effective as a standalone effort. It should be part of a broader, more comprehensive approach involving different parts of government, the private sector, and civil society to work together 
on reducing uh, the threat of violent extremism. When you talk about communication, social media and, and the internet, uh, what we promote is a multifaceted approach in terms of if content is illegal, yes, it might be helpful to take it down, just to make your point. There are red lines. If there is information made available through social media or the internet that simply is incorrect, or represents an incorrect interpretation, you can counter it by providing the right interpretation and the correct information. But the most critical uh, and also the most challenging part is how to create your own content, your own message. What is it that you have to tell, that you can tell young people to give them an actual alternative? And then the fourth element is uh, how to make people more resilient. Internet is there to stay, social media is there to stay. We can do many things, but one thing is for sure, there will always be negative, wrong content on social media and the internet. So one of the key factors you should try to work on is make people more resilient, that even if they are confronted with that information, with that message, they are not triggered into the wrong direction. And obviously, education is critical to make people more resilient. We talk a lot about communication messages that exist on the internet, uh, social media, even formal government communications. But let's not forget, that's another lesson learned, that the policies, the actions, the statements made by governments are in itself potentially very influential indirect communications, indirect messages. So it is important that what you communicate explicitly, directly, actually is consistent with your own actions and your own policies. You have to make sure that you walk the talk, because one of the things that a lot of people nowadays, of course, do is check consistency. And if it's not consistent, they don't trust it, and therefore they will not listen to it. Or it might even prove their point. Consistency also means that you have to put every effort in place to make sure that what you do and communicate domestically is consistent with what you do and communicate internationally that your policies are consistent with your actions and what people who represent you are doing on the ground. This leads to the other critical element, credibility. Unfortunately, maybe, but research has shown that governments are not always the most effective and credible messenger when it comes to the young people that we are talking about young people who might have concerns, young people who are angry, people who don't really trust governments anymore. So yes, government communication is still important, but don't rely on it as the only source to try to influence young people. You need civil society organizations, but also informal community leaders. Who are the people that your young people actually listen to? Who are the people that they want to reach out to when they are struggling with their real life questions? Who are the informal youth leaders? Where is that one teacher that we all used to listen to when we were young in high school? Where is the religious authority? All those people should be identified and empowered in terms of communication. And then a very important thing, uh, develop your own real life alternative. You cannot only tell people this is what you're not allowed to do. You should also tell people, well, if you have a concern, this is actually a way in which you can deal with those concerns, but in a more constructive and positive ways. And you have to make sure that the alternative that you show them is a real life alternative. Yeah. So if there are no jobs, you can say, well, you, you better do something with your life instead of staying at home and starting to bother other people. But please work on then 
creating jobs. And the final thing is, um, it's obvious, but sometimes when we talk about communications, you have the online world, yes, the messaging, the interaction is critical, but nothing will be effective if you do not combine it with real life, on the ground, face to face communication. Communication obviously is about interaction. Social media is about interaction. Recruitment is not only recruitment through social media, just messaging. It's very smart social interaction trying to step by step get somebody onto the wrong path. So you should do the same. It's not only messaging, it's about interaction. And I do want to underline the fact that was also mentioned by my colleague from Facebook. Yes, it's critical. We have no choice then to become smarter in our own communications, but it's also an area that still needs a lot of research and, and, and to create a better evidence-based. Looking at the time, um, I will uh, give you two examples of what we as an organization actually has, has done, because uh, it's also about doing. One thing that, that uh, is good to realize that in terms of uh, messaging, opinions um, that can be used as a counter-narrative or an alternative narrative, you don't only have to develop them, they already exist. In many cases, it's about identifying where are those counter-narratives, where are those credible messengers, and make them available. So this is what we did as an organization. We created an online counter-narrative library with now more than 350 existing uh, narratives, counter-narratives, alternative narratives, different languages, looking at different forms of violent extremism. It's password protected but it's made available online so that those people who are working in the front lines, and again, when we talk about young people at risk, in many cases, the front line is not government. It's community leaders, it's teachers. What if a teacher hears somebody say something and he wants to respond, but he doesn't know what to say? Through this library, we made that available. It also consists of three regional collections of counter narratives, Southeast Asia, the MENA region, and we will soon develop one for East Africa. And my final example is what I said, maybe the most critical, but also mo the most difficult thing, how to create an alternative narrative uh, and message on social media, on the internet. Yeah. For this, we had a, a program called Creative Mind for Social Good. We identified credible local messengers mostly young people from communities at risk in relevant countries, brought them together, um, connected them with people from social media like Facebook uh, and our CV expertise. There are a lot of young people who have good ideas, but they don't know how to translate it into a good social media campaign. So you need to support them with the technical and practical information and get it out there. And the real challenge is how to come up with something that resonates, that really resonates with the target audience that we are talking about. What makes them tick? What makes them feel uh, a young hero? But in a positive sense of the word. You have to understand basic concepts like respect, honor, dignity, shame. How to translate that into a message that will resonate for them and lead them into the right direction or redirect their energy uh, for the good of all of us. And with that, there are many more things I could have said, uh, but take it as a starting point. And also for me, of course, I'm more than happy to answer any questions uh, that you have. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> can you now come in, uh, Dr. Glimberg? Uh, I think uh, it'd be very important if you were able to, to balance out the whole issue about uh, control of social media and uh, freedom of s expression. But more particularly, we would like you to understand <coughs> that uh, the fine line uh, does in itself is a challenge. So if you can address that more specifically, we'd be grateful. Indeed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zahai. And uh, thank you also to the organizers for inviting me to this very interesting event. It's uh, great to be back. I was here just two months ago, actually. 
So my name is Alexander Klimberg, and uh, although it says that I am the director of the Global Commission on Stability for Cyberspace, I'm not talking in that capacity today. I'm only speaking as a member of civil society and a researcher. And I want to make one very simple framing point to conclude the discussion with, that the wider topic of countering violent extremism is not only about counter-terrorism, it's also about the future of the internet and cyberspace and information domain writ large. So I am not an expert on countering violent extremism, and I'm certainly not a counter-terrorism expert. Instead, I work on the twinned issues of international cybersecurity and internet governance. International cybersecurity is the game of war and peace between states and addresses effectively what is legally permissible in both peacetime and wartime and what is both technically practical. And that is also the context within which most national cybersecurity strategies are drafted. Internet governance, on the other hand, is usually the game of civil society and private sector and is about the management of the world's internet resources, effectively how you actually get your email or are able to navigate cyberspace. And as I said, it's mostly an issue of the civil society and the private sector. Government plays a minor role here. And I think it's very important to remind ourselves that cyberspace is therefore a man-made domain. There are no natural characteristics at play here. There is no uh, sea uh, continental shelf from which we can derive, for instance, a, a law, and there is no gravity that we can effectively use as a point of departure. We say what gravity is in cyberspace. And when we change our aspirations, those natural laws will change as well. So, what that implies is, as you may also know, there's a great game going on in cyberspace right now. Some people have even referred to it as the new Cold War, in which the two opposite views of what cyberspace should be have been meeting head on since well over a decade and a half now. On the one hand, you have a group of nations that are for an intergovernmental model of cyberspace that want to see the internet managed through an intergovernmental context. And there's, on the other hand, there are those who fight for the multi-stakeholder model of managing internet resources that we know today. And those two sides have been effectively been engaged in long-running disputes within the UN, the OSCE, the Asian Regional Forum, many intergovernmental contexts, as well as within civil society and the private sector. Now, you might ask yourself, what does this all have to do with countering violent extremism? Well, CVE is actually a very critical point on this battlefield, on this political battlefield between the two opposing views. Actually, the word itself is a flag of sorts. Countering violent extremism is primarily an American term. Uh, it is, uh, represents, and it's also used by many of the so-called like-minded group in liberal democracies. And in other countries, such as China and Russia, instead they prefer the term countering cyber terrorism. And the term cyber terrorism, however, is very different from countering violent extremism. And the term cyberterrorism itself is a very powerful meme. It's a meme I want to talk about a little bit. Cyberterrorism as a meme doesn't only address what some of us in the academic community would seem the obvious, which is causing kinetic effect through cyber means, blowing something up with a cyber attack. It also goes beyond what we also call terrorist use of the internet, which could be recruitment, planning, propaganda, some of the issues that are addressed in CVE. It basically applies to any content you don't like. And it can and has been used very often by many different governments this way. Not only sometimes within a very shaky legal framework, but sometimes outside of any legal framework. And ultimately, there are many governments that would like to use a cyber terrorism narrative to further an internet that is not based on a multi-stakeholder model, but an intergovernmental model, and where it is possible to effectively employ the noticed and take down policies that are used in counterterrorism and, and law enforcement cooperation to effectively remove content at source worldwide. That is not something that is hidden, that's been out in the open for a number of years, and this is uh, a significant issue because it basically is a very different model of the internet that we have today. Arranged against this intergovernmental model of the internet are the like-minded group of nations, and those like-minded group who do fight for the multi-stakeholder approach also have a particular interest, which is keeping the core of the internet outside of government control. The Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace uh, launched a call to protect the public core of the internet here in New Delhi just two months ago. And the only plea is to all actors, state and non-state actors, to respect the basic internet functionality 
and not tamper with it because we all depend on it. So of course, protecting the internet is a rather abstract concept and counterism is a lot more tangible as a concept. And sometimes it also functions as a political override, making it a much more burning issue and easier for politicians to deal with. And things seem to escalate rather easily in this domain. To give you an example, even though the like-minded group don't use the term cyber terrorism very often, things can change. For instance, in April of 2015, the French TV channel, TV5, uh, was attacked by a cyber attack and forced off air by a group claiming to be cyber jihadis working on behalf of ISIS. And suddenly we had a real case of cyber terrorism. And people were talking about it in Europe just while we were debating a very important piece of legislation, the Network Information Security Directive, the first EU law on cybersecurity. Then it transpired it wasn't actually from cyber jihadis, but it was by a military intelligence organization of a foreign government. So from a cybersecurity point of view, there are different approaches that can be taken when dealing with internet content that you don't like. In general, people like myself favor more industry associated solutions rather than punishing content and content providers. We heard beforehand about GIF uh, CT, the Global Internet Forum on Counterterrorism, for instance, which was uh, actually set up under the uh, EU Internet Forum auspices and encouraged by the EU. As far as I gather, this initiative has been very successful in reducing the scope of this type of content online. And I think this is particularly encouraging because what many companies simply could do is simply enforcing their terms of service, and then many of the bad stuff on the internet will simply go away. That's including information warfare, so-called fake news, kind of radicalization. All they have to do is simply follow the terms of service that they've mapped out, and these issues will be addressed. Of course, there's another approach to doing it, and that's a legislative approach. And to give you an example of what's happening in Europe right now, uh, in Germany, a new law known as uh, Netz uh, DG has made it a criminal offense, for instance, for um, social media companies, among others, to leave clearly illegal content online. Uh, and they have to remove it themselves within a very short time frame, between one day and one week, depending on. And if they don't fail to do so, it's a 50 million euro fine. So as you can imagine, um, those companies are rushing to, to implement this law. I think Facebook is actually hiring something like 1,000 people to manage hate speech in Germany alone. So it's clearly becoming a rather big issue. And it's an interesting concept, except for when it clearly doesn't work. And I'll give you an example where it didn't work, is that the proponent of the law, the person, the justice minister, called one of his political opponents an idiot um, for backing that law and then had his tweet removed because it violated hate speech. <laughs> now, for those of you who are familiar with democracies, the, you know, the ability to call your opponent an idiot is kind of vital to the functioning of the whole thing. So that's not probably some place we really want to end up. I want to really conclude with something quite simple. Yes, of course, there is illegal content in every jurisdiction, right? And if governments feel the need to center that content, that's between them and their own citizens to decide. But one of the reasons why the internet has been so successful is because the actual running of the internet resources, the actual core of the internet, has been outside of these types of debate. So when thinking how to, to counter radical uh, extremism or any kind of offensive content, we should, not only, we should be only be concentrating on the individual content itself and not really the road, not the internet that transports this content. For that might take us down a path we really don't want to go down. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I would uh, thank Ms. Kitby for the tribute she paid to India and in opening remarks about uh, how we are having one, uh, the second, uh, uh, second largest uh, Muslim population in the world did not contribute to the uh, ISIS. And there were recruits would, uh, to ISIS would be less than about 100, if at all. So um, the issue is that when you talk about narratives and the content, and you talked about civil society, what is it that kept uh, India immune from this kind of uh, radicalization? I think the issue was that we have a very strong cultural base. And actually, if you look at it, if you want to talk about identity chauvinism and the consolidation of identity, which leads to kind of this kind of radicalization, you must look at the cultural aspect. 
the fact that uh, the cultural ties in this country are more localized and therefore do not allow a consolidation of an identity which goes outside our own context. So with that actually is where the strength lies and I think uh, n uh, narratives to counter violent extremism on net could be built around culture and the local pull uh, as against the pan-Islamic uh, um, pulls or in other contexts, the transnational pulls that would uh, lead to that kind of identity, which generates this kind of extremism. So um, uh, any questions from the audience? Well, Maya, yours is the first hand up, so. I have a comment. I hope it's short. <laughs> Um, I'm Maya Mirchandani. I'm a senior fellow at the Observer Research Foundation. Um, uh, Brian Fishman, I think I'm ad addressing you, actually. I know that you talked about Voice Positive. It's a program that I'm actually involved with as well. Uh, and uh, you talked about the 180 people who are looking at uh, terrorist content on Facebook, and those numbers are going up, obviously. But I think the larger question that's uh, facing social media today is uh, do you want to take more ownership of the content that's going online uh, via your users? Or do you want to ha be hands off and say, we're just a platform and we're not the content providers? Because that, I think, is becoming uh, a dilemma. You all pretty much, if I, if I do a poll in this room, I'm sure everyone is getting their news off their Facebook feed or their Twitter feed. Uh, who's opening up a newspaper, who's going to a website, um, much fewer people than earlier. So where does this place the responsibility of social media platforms like yourself, uh, like Twitter, like Google, to be more cognizant of the fact that there is a space that's being misused as we're talking about? Um, I just like, you know, that was my comment, but perhaps your views on that. Uh, would you like to answer now or to take some more questions first? Uh, either way. Okay. Uh, can we have a question from you, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Madalitso Piri. I'm, I'm a doctoral research fellow in South Africa at UNISA. Uh, just a, a, a quick question. Um, I think there was not a lot of emphasis on how uh, ideology can actually be uh, targeted. And in, in a sense, what I'm thinking about is how or what strategies can actually be adopted to understand the mind of divisive ideological um, approaches to, to terrorism, but also cognizant of the fact that, um, or the idea that we need to get over uh, that the modern world is predicated on, on, on violence. So how then do we feed or feel come up with a strategy that gives a different alternative uh, to a world that is not predicated or an ideology that's not predicated on, on violence itself, you know, like transcending uh, the modern narrative. So I just want your thoughts maybe from Evo or Abistam. Thanks. Yeah, I think they're two very different questions. So Brian, can you just quickly finish that? Uh, your <laughs> sure. I, I Look, I, Facebook was founded to, to be a place for community, to empower voices all over the world, to, to communicate with friends and family and people that they never would have been able to reach in the past. Um, that's still core to our mission, to, to, to building a product that allows for people to speak for themselves and build communities for themselves and, and make, as much as possible, meaningful connections that uh, that improve their lives and the lives of the people that they interact with and love. Um, that all sounds very high-minded, um, but that's real. Like people, we we really feel that at, at, at Facebook. That is that that remains very true to the mission of the company and the way the reason why people come into work in the morning. When it comes to terrorism, though, you know, we think that people are going to engage. People are going to be able to build community when they feel safe. And many of our community standards are built around that principle, right? We don't allow bullying. We don't allow, um, we don't allow uh, revenge porn. We don't allow a, a number of different things on our platform 
because they are efforts to make people feel, they make people feel unsafe in the real world um, and they have real world impacts on them. Our position on terrorism is very similar to that. Um, we think people engage more, they build community more when they feel safe. And we think that terrorist cuts against that. Facebook is designed to bring the world closer together. Terrorists want to tear it farther apart. Um, and so we take this very hard line against terrorist organizations, which we effectively define, and, I, and I'll just say this quickly because I know it usually comes up in, in a very academic way, actually, as, as non-state actors that use violence to advance a political or ideological agenda. Um, we don't want our platform to be a place to promote and advance it, violent causes. Um, and we think that our business interest there of creating a space that allows for meaningful engagement among our community is actually very aligned with the, the real world interests of both governments and societies around the world. Um, so we're really, really committed to this. Um, and Brian, can we just... Oh yeah, I'll wrap it up. I could go on forever. Um, thank you. Yeah, because I think uh, the social media platforms uh, keep saying the same thing. They're very, very uh, sincere about their utterances about how they do not wish to promote terrorism. But I think that uh, the, uh, thing, the, uh, the question remains unanswered as to what exactly are we going to do about it. So uh, I think the content part, which has been very well brought out, I think that we seem to be missing out. So who of you would like to take the thing? Ivo, would you like to answer on the content issue as to how yeah, the, the content, but I, I think you focused on ideology. Because I think there are, there are different forms of, of content uh, or, or sources of content. And that would, would, would be my first reply. So ideology, I think, is one of the factors to look into. I know some people say it's basically an ideological challenge. I, I, I don't think that is necessarily completely true. As I said, uh, even if you would focus on certain ideologies, still the underlying question is, why are some people attracted to that ideology and why, by the way, most people, the vast majority, not? Um, so it's not only about countering an ideology, it's also about making sure that you understand, and unfortunately, maybe also to answer your question, it's very context-specific, why in certain countries, why in certain communities, a certain percentage of people actually is influenced by a certain ideology and try to work on the reasons that makes them vulnerable in the first place. So that's one thing. To really understand uh, the ideology, but I think even one level deeper, the psychology of the ideology. Because what I see happening is not only that certain groups are using certain arguments, are making reference to certain sources. I think they're also very smart in working the minds of the people that they try to influence. And even that mindset might be influenced by a certain ideology. Uh, so you need, uh, let's say, experts from the inside to help you better understand what the ideology actually is about but also how it influences the way people look at themselves and, and the world. And then the last part is yeah, how to create alternatives for young people. I just need to take some more questions. Uh, yeah, but this is my last point, my last part of the answer. So the, the last thing is how to create alternatives. Because as I said, you cannot say to young people, you're not allowed, they will try to leave the house anyway, yeah? if they want to leave the house. So what is it that you have to offer? Uh, and again, this is very, very context-specific, but you need to work on that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just two questions from the two ladies, one at the behind there and the one right at the end. I, I have a yeah. question for Alexander. Um, if I understand you correctly, you, you talked about a foreign government actually pretending to be cyber jihadis and making an intervention. So I would call that state terrorism, right? And I find that a little bit missing in our discussions about terrorism and counterterrorism, that there are states that behave as terrorists. Now, would you want to say what foreign government it was? 
Before you answer that, can the, the lady at the back? Hi. Yeah, sure. Hi, hello. My name is Leah Kasper. I run a digital rights organization based in the UK. Um, my question is for Brian. Just before I ask the question, just one small comment on the something that you made, the analogy with child sexual exploitation imagery, which I thought was really interesting, but slightly misleading in the context of social media platforms. Um, the reason being just that uh, on, according to the IWF or the Internet Watch Foundation, which is a self-regulatory body that deals with this issue, only 2% of sexual online abuse images are actually hosted on social media platforms. So it's, it's, it's completely different. Um, but my question is um, uh, to, to, to Brian about intermediary liability. So arguably there are a number of issues with handing over what is effectively a state function to, private, to the private sector, the function of policing speech. Um, but say we put aside the question of should or should not uh, companies be involved in this, and if we just focus on the pragmatic question of whether or not this works, uh, my question is whether uh, what are the measurements for how uh, for the impact of the programs that you mentioned? So what is the evidence uh, that that these approaches are working? Thank you, Alexander. Thank you. Um, I'd like to pick up actually on also the previous question, but just to come back on the the act of of, of a false flag cyber terrorism that was inflicted upon France uh, in May in 2015. Um, that was a very big issue. It's not the only false flag attack that has been carried out. Uh, it has actually been widely published. It's not confidential information in any way. And the the French newspaper that fit, leaked this analysis done by the French government, said it pointed to a group known as APT-28, which is also known as the Russian Military Intelligence Organization, GRU, GRU. If this is true or not, you can take it up with the French and with the Russians. But in any case, the implication was that this was a false flag attack that had other, uh, uh, other um, purposes than to destroy a piece of infrastructure that, interestingly enough, was not defined as critical under French law. It is now, as far as I understand. Um, the second point I think I want to quickly address was the one about social media, because that was in, in counter-messaging and counter-ideology. So we talked about counter-ideology beforehand, but Ivo made a very interesting point that's not only about the content of the ideology or a counter-narrative, which is usually the term I think professionals in that space use, um, but also the instruments of what we're dealing with, for instance, in social media. So the same thing applies with information warfare campaigns, which is more my field, and that is that effectively social media has created through no malicious, malicious intent, an echo chamber based on the algorithms that we have built through our user behavior. We want to click certain things, therefore certain things will get clicked, therefore the algorithms will make sure we see more of those certain things. Nothing malicious, it's just the way these things develop. So the long story short of this would be is, I think it's very encouraging that companies such as Facebook have done an about turn and it basically said nobody could control these algorithms and I started saying, okay, well, we can tweak it. That will open a huge, long discussion of how to tweak it and why and what sense that's actually permissible and where is that social engineering and certain things like that. But it's a good discussion to have. And it's very encouraging that those very powerful content intermediaries that con control this content and control these algorithms are ready to have this conversation because there was no malicious intent from half of these, uh, half of these types of developments. It was just basically bad luck. So one last question to wind it up. Uh, I just wanted to uh, bring the, the points of uh, encrypted platforms. Sorry, thank you. Uh, in the last two years, there has been a lot of action on uh, social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, there was an initiative taken by uh, governments in Europe, France, UK, coming together and putting a pressure on that, which has brought down these four points that you explained in the beginning. But uh, that doesn't mean the content has actually gone away. It has just gone to Telegram and to a lot of these encrypted platforms. So there you still get, the st still get the material. How do we counter that? Is that even a point uh, that's being discussed uh, when we are talking about um, online extremism and online radicalization? Because not having, um, no, having zero tolerance policy towards terrorism on Facebook or Twitter doesn't mean that that's eliminated, right? I mean, it's under the surface. So if, if, uh, if you can all just comment quickly on that, perhaps, or throw some light on that, that would be interesting to understand. I, I'll be brief and just say that it, it, there was terrorism before the internet. 
um, and there will continue to be terrorism. Um, in many ways, the online world reflects the offline world, which Eva was making that, that, that point earlier. Um, the, the first terrorist internet site was built in 1983 by an American white nationalist. It was just a, a digital bulletin board. Um, we could go on the Internet Archives Wayback Machine and I could show you Al-Qaeda's first website, which was established in 1996. Um, the Internet has been used by these groups for a long time. We have focused on that issue in more recent years. But this gets to the, the, the point that we are not going to go to a world, a perfect world, where none of these groups are able to use digital space at all. What we can do is suppress this. We can push it back into the corners of the internet where these groups are not able to mobilize at a wide scale. And I think we are making progress in that direction. Um, and that's certainly, I think we're making progress at Facebook. We are not perfect. We continue to find, to improve, but we improve because we find places where we've made missteps. Um, and I, th but I also think other, other major platforms are doing the same thing. Um, that's why GIFCT and some of the hash sharing thing efforts are really important to spread out those best practices to smaller to smaller um, uh, companies. Um, and I would say on on the on the encrypted point, um, encryption is a, a critical tool for a lot of folks around the world that are facing a range of different kinds of security threats. Um, and we think that that is valuable. At Facebook, we think it is critically important that encrypted platforms are able and willing to work with appropriate authorities as best they can. And for example, we do that with WhatsApp, which is a Facebook property. Um, we think that is the right place and the right way to engage. But I'd say that that kind of core technology is not going away. It is ubiquitous. It is out there in the world. Um, and the, the question we have to answer is how do we manage it responsibly rather than how do we put it back in the box? It's not going to go back in the box. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, first thank the ORF for organizing this wonderful summit, and uh, which is helping to bring out some very critical issues. We all understand that these uh, sessions do not help in finding answers, but they definitely like to bring the issues back onto the table. So I think the debate between regulation of cyberspace and uh, how it's going to be misused for uh, radicalization will continue. And I think we will have to find ways about uh, how to deal with it. Governments will have to come uh, forward. They will have to get themselves updated about uh, technologies and will need to update themselves. I think that's one of the areas where they seem to be lagging behind of course, to the benefit of the social media companies. But uh, there, I think, responsibility needs to come from both sides. And I think the vital question about content, what is it that is going out there, I think that's everybody's responsibility. And the major question that came out was that uh, civil society, non-government institutions, they are key to all this, and I think that includes us all in the room. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.